This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Tonight we're honored and privileged to have uh, Rinaldo uh, Brutico. Um, Rinaldo is the founder and chair of the World Business Academy, um, of the California Public Interest Law Center, and the, and the Safe Energy Project, which is a nonprofit group advocating for the closure of nuclear power plants in California. I'm not sure if Ronaldo's going to talk about that today. If he does not, uh, don't feel shy about asking him questions, because I'm sure he'd <laughs> be very happy to talk about uh, um, Diablo Canyon or whatever. Um, <clears throat> as a business leader, he's the CEO of uh, Shangri-La Consulting Group. He spent many years on the board of uh, Men's Warehouse. He's the chief operating, or was the chief operating officer for uh, Channel 100, the first company in the world to offer pay cable television services, founder and CEO of Universal Subscription T Television, uh, founder and chairman of H2 Clipper. Um, this is, I just found out about this. This is, um, um, they're building hy hydrogen powered dirigibles. And um, if, in my class at least, we've been talking a lot about hydrogen, and um, Rinaldo knows a lot about uh, uh, using hydrogen in uh, various ways as an energy source. If you're too, too young to know what a dirigible is, it's kind of like a Zeppelin. The man builds Zeppelins. <laughs> Um, he's also founder and CEO of Seven Oaks Ranch, an organic uh, food and cosmetic company. <clears throat> and I was reviewing my notes, and I saw that he was the um, chief executive and the executive chief. And I thought, I don't know very much about business. That must be a very important distinction. So I did the rational thing, and I put on my glasses, and it actually says he's the executive chef. <laughs> So we learned about that over dinner. So now I have this image of him flying in his Zeppelin, closing down nuclear power plants and cooking organic frittata or something in, <laughs> in a very nice suit. You know. <laughs> in any case, um, he is the co-author of uh, two books, uh, Freedom from Mideast Oil, and also Profiles in Power, the Anti-Nuclear Movement and the, uh, and the dawn of the solar age. And tonight, he would like to speak about uh, the ethics of nuclear power. Please welcome Rinaldo Brutico. Thank you, Gregory. That uh, was a nice introduction. The California Public Interest Law Center, uh, I started actually in 1968 when I was a first year law student. Yeah, second year law student in UCLA, and it no longer exists. Uh, we were very successful, and it became the consumer law department of the city of Los Angeles, and uh, that continues to exist in that way. Other than that, um, that and a few other things that I've done in my life were all correct. But thank you very much. Uh, what's interesting about that bio is um, there's only one way you can st stitch my career together, because uh, it makes no sense on any, well, there's one way it makes sense, and that it demonstrates that I'm congenitally unemployable. <laughs> I cannot work for anybody else. So I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. But it also demonstrates that if you, if you want to know the, the throughput line uh, of my career, which I recommend every person, particularly the students in the audience tonight, think about, the throughput line is how can I serve? If you just keep showing up asking that question, you'll be amazed at the places you find yourself. Because you don't have to go looking for what it is you're supposed to do. What you're there to do comes to you. And so it's sort of in that spirit I want to talk about nuclear power. So this is the actual title of 
chapter five of my last book in, on nuclear, which was eight years ago. And, and it was called A Mistake in Search of a Mission. All the chapter headings are very pithy. I enjoy doing ch pithy chapter headings. Um, but we really like this one because it tells a, a story just by looking at the, the, the wording itself. So nuclear power is a technical, economic, and ethical disaster. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. And I'm delighted I have economic in there for the students that will see this tomorrow in Gregory's class. Um, and so I'm going to cover all of those points in some detail, and then we're going to have questions and answers. Uh, but I want to start with this man, Dr. James Hansen. And the reason I want to start with Jim Hansen, Jim is the finest climatologist probably on the planet today. A little over a year ago, he came out in favor of nuclear power. And his work is excellent. And as you can see by this quote, uh, he's now embracing nuclear power, and he went silent for about a, a year after Fukushima. Um, he was rethinking it, but then he recently restated his support for nuclear power. And why I'm starting with Jim is he's really, he's right about climate change. He is dead wrong about nuclear, meaning that he is literally wrong to the point people are going to die, are dying. And I'll get to that in a second. But, but what's really fascinating is, see, Jim is so committed to climate science, he's so aware of what you're about to hear later on in this little presentation, that he's literally scared to death. And he's willing to embrace anything he thinks might be able to address that issue. Now, unfortunately, grasping at, at nuclear is technically, economically, and ethically a disaster. Now, I will come to show you why all three of those words are absolutely accurate. And I believe that Jim Hansen, if he wasn't so frightened, would also come to the same conclusion, because he's a very bright guy. So the, the point I would like to make for you right now is that when we're scared, we sometimes do things we're not proud of. And we justify it on the grounds that, well, it's the lesser of two evils. Ever heard that one? Lesser of two evils. I think that's where Jim ended up losing on this particular type of the argument. And what I'm hopeful is that all the Jim Hansons in the world will come to see why we not only don't want nuclear, not only do we not need nuclear, nuclear is a disaster on virtually every level. So <clears throat> there's a reason we no longer test nuclear weapons above ground. I'm sure many of you know that uh, we used to test nuclear weapons above ground. And when we did, John Kennedy observed in July of 1963 that the loss of even one human life or the malformation of even one baby who may be born long after we are gone should be of concern to us all. Our children and grandchildren are not merely statistics toward which we can be indifferent. What he was talking about was called strontium-90. Strontium-90 has only two sources in the world. It cannot be dug up. It can only be created one of two ways. It can either be created through the above ground testing of a nuclear weapon, which gives off a tremendous amount of strontium-90, or the normal operation of every nuclear power plant in America, which also gives off deadly quantities of strontium-90. And that is the only two ways that you can create strontium-90. Now, what's fascinating about that is because he concluded this as a result of a thing called the Baby Teeth Study and ended up, in the last official major act of his life in October of 1963, he first unilaterally suspended all nuclear testing above ground, saying, we realize now we're basically irradiating our own people. Strontium-90 being an extremely active, aggressive, radioactive isotope, deadly very deadly radioactive isotope. And he had a delightful wife named Jackie and a couple of young kids, John and Carolyn. Carolyn just became the ambassador to Japan two days ago, three days ago, at Caroline, rather. And, and what he decided was he was going to stop nuclear testing even if nobody else did. But then he sent a copy of the study off to the Russians, the Chinese, and the French, and the British. Everybody read the study and said, oh my god, the proof is inc incontrovertible. Strontium-90 is deadly. It's accumulating in the tissues of our children, first and foremost, and secondarily in the mammary glands of lactating women, and thirdly, in uh, thyroids, and fourthly, in prostates. So the, the, the cancer cluster issue was incontrovertible, and in October of 63, he signed the above ground nuclear test ban treaty. Now, that's record time from July 26 to suspend it unilaterally to October. That's how devastating the data is. I want to show you something about the test ban treaty. So this is an example right here. It was 
uh, signed, as you can see, by the tall blue line, 1963. So the, this is the strontium-90 levels as measured by actual baby teeth ground up. Remember I referenced the baby teeth study. So those baby teeth were ground up. And the reason is that strontium-90 bonds to calcium. So if I want to know how much strontium-90 you've absorbed, give me one of your teeth, and it'll tell me exactly how much strontium-90 you've absorbed and have uptaked. Now, strontium-90 has a 29-year half-life. So in an adult, you don't actually have a great marker because everything that's older than about 60-some years is probably pretty much gone. And after 29 years, half gone. So we looked at this and we said, okay, that's the level of strontium-90 when the test ban treaty was signed. This is what happened directly after test ban treaty signing. Strontium levels start dropping precipitously, if you'll notice. Now here's the interesting thing that happens. Look right here, and you see this bar is starting to get smaller, but it's happening in the 70s. Now, the interesting thing that happened in the 70s is a lot of nuclear reactors came online, and as a result, nuclear power expanded dramatically, and as a result, <coughs> that's what happened to strontium-90. Now, I want you to know that that date out there at the end, which is uh, 2013, is a projected date that was provided to us by the Radiation and Public Health Project, which did all the original columns using the same exact data protocol. Uh, and if you also want to know something that's startling, notice that it's now higher than it was when we were radiating ourselves with above ground nuclear testing. We are now at a higher level of strontium-90. That's very, very scary stuff. I'm beginning, I hope, to, for you to see what the ethical issue is. If you are killing people and you know it, and you keep doing it, is that ethical? If you ask the people at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they say, well, you know, people drive in cars and people die in cars, so I guess that's just part of the problem of having cars. And that's really a false analogy, because the Federal Highway Safety Commission has dramatically lowered the death in, car, in vehicular accidents. In fact, it's cut it in half, even though we travel twice as many miles in the last 30 years, by creating collapsible steering columns, seat belts, three-point restraint systems, airbags, et cetera. So the Federal Highway Safety Administration has been doing its job reducing the risk of driving a car. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, on the other hand, has been giving us these levels of increasing cancer. There'll be more about that in a second. So do we know nuclear closing a nuclear power plant will actually save the lives of women, men, and children? Because if we're making the case that you're killing people with them open, seems to me it's only fair to ask this question. If you close one, will you save lives? And it turns out, yes. And we already have proof that it does. And guess where that proof occurred? Right here in California. We closed Rancho Seco in 1989 by a local initiative. Here's what happened. After the shutdown, childhood cancer rates in the surrounding area dropped dramatically. This is the drop. If you'll notice, this is the cancer rate in clusters in the adjacent county, the, re the, re the reactor, when it was operating. This line represents average cancer clusters in the state of California. Now, why it dropped below that level is because, as you would expect, if you live in a highly rural area where Rancho Seca was located, you would anticipate fewer carcinogenic in 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 incidences. In other words, if you live in a big city with lots of pollution and lots of other things going on, asbestos in, in the walls and you name it, all the different ways that we have environmental pollutants today, you would expect to have a higher average rate of cancer than you would if there's nothing but pasture land around. And that's exactly what this graph shows. This is what the cancer rate was, and that's what it became. So yes, we know when you close a nuclear power plant, you can actually save lives, huge numbers of lives. After the shutdown, thyroid cancer rates in the surrounding area dropped, again, dramatically. There's the drop, operating before, below California standards later, thyroid cancer. So, and in case you think I'm the only one thinking this, the recent chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission no longer feels any reactor in America is safe. Here's his quote. This is Gregory Jessica. By the way, he served until 2012. This is not ancient history. This is like last year. Read that quote. All 104 nuclear power reactors now in operation in the United States have a safety problem that cannot be fixed, and they should be replaced with newer technology. Now, I'm... A big believer, if we had newer technology that worked, I'd be all for replacing it. Unfortunately, we don't. I was asked, and Claude here in the front row is with, uh, with me the day I was doing a speech for the Rotary. And, um, and I was asked, uh, well, what about the pebble reactors? 
And I said, great idea, fabulous theory, can't wait till they build one. Don't exist anywhere in the world. In fact, the only beta site for a pebble reactor was canceled five years ago. So that, it, that newer technology, quote unquote, doesn't exist. You'll hear all kinds of arguments about, quote, next generation reactors, close quote. None of them exist. In fact, to the best of my knowledge, and we monitor every filing at the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission, we've never seen a new re nuclear reactor design yet presented that's ready for deployment. So we don't have the new technology, and we still have all these cancer rates. Now, I like to bring Fukushima into this conversation at this point, because even though we know we're killing people when we have nuclear reactors with strontium-90, more on that later. And we know that when we shut them down, we stop killing people, which seems to me to be an ethically simple question. And so even if the thing did cost us money, we'd say, okay, well, human life is worth something. Let's close these things out. But Fukushima really brings it into a really dramatic and current, uh, I think, envelope of understanding. So I don't know if you're aware of it, but we're now more than three years past Fukushima. Uh, that nuclear meltdown, remember that only one chance in many millions that you could have a nuclear meltdown, except we keep having them. Who keeps telling us that it's only one chance in many millions? And why do we believe them at this point? Fukushima is leaking 100,000 gallons a day of contaminated, meaning radioactively contaminated water into the Pacific. All bluefin tuna, not some, all bluefin tuna caught off California in the last three months show levels of radioactivity. The American Medical Association called for radiation testing of all seafood, um, all edible Pacific seafood, and I believe that will become mandatory in near, ter near term. And we're now seeing increased hyperthyroidism in newborns in all U.S. West Coast states, which means Hawaii, because that's where the plume from Fukushima comes, and all the way down through Washington, Oregon, and California. Now, what's fascinating about this, Hawaii, Alaska, down, what's fascinating about it is if you're already contaminating fish from Fukushima and you're still dropping 100,000 gallons of water that's toxic, radioactive, into the ocean every day, at some point, wouldn't you say to yourself, the idea of operating more of these things is a little bit crazy? So let's take a look at that. We've been told that there is one chance in millions that a reactor could have a serious meltdown event, except we did have Three Mile Island we did have Chernobyl, and of course, we got Fukushima. So we've had three events in less than 50 years of something that's only supposed to be one chance out of many millions. As you're about to hear in a little bit later, the number one most likely reactor, according to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to have a problem where you'll have another meltdown happens to be Diablo Canyon. So looks like they were wrong. If it's one chance in millions, it, they were wrong already. And we think the Diablo Canyon plant could be next, and we're going to tell you why. You see, anything, and this is all according to NRC data, the, the Union of Concerned Scientists just released a report literally this week, um, which is called, and I love the title, Seismic Shift Diablo Canyon Literally and Figuratively on Shaky Ground. Read that quote. They found that the NRC is not holding Diablo Canyon to the same standards as other plants. Since the discovery of a new fault just 2,000 feet, that's sort of like just outside this building, from the two reactors, PG&E has failed to show any evidence that the plant meets NRC safety standards. Other plants, okay, let me stop. There are five plants in America that have failed to meet seismic standards. Four of the five have either been shut down or forced to cease operating until full repairs could be made. The only exception is Diablo Canyon. That's why it's the most dangerous seismic reactor. It's the only one that's still in operation right now. And what's particularly scary about this is the chief inspector for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the chief field inspector of the Diablo Canyon plant, issued a written report saying the plant is operating illegally past its permit because it's seismically unsafe meaning in a good earthquake, we would have Fukushima on our doorstep. Okay, and that's again, the re that's the inspector for the NRC itself. How large a disaster would this be? Well, here's where we are, that, that arrow. What you're seeing is the nuclear reactor plume as calculated by wind carrying distances. 
Those are, these are fairly standard calculations. There's nothing unique about them. What you do is you take the wind direction. If you notice, that's about how the wind comes from the north and the west here to Santa Barbara. And you are here in the middle of that plume. Now, if you recall, uh, as soon as Fukushima happened, the U.S. government issued a, um, a, an immediate evacuation of every human being within 50 miles of the plant, ultimately extended to 100. We are within 87 miles of Diablo. However, our 87 is exactly downwind, which means we're going to get a do radiation dose here, I would guess, of about the equivalent of if, if we were th about 30 miles away, which, of course, is deadly. It's not, it's, it, it's not like a minor like hiccup. <clears throat> There's the additional problem, as you know, that tsunamis are prevalent. <laughs> And each of these little red bullseyes shows you where four severe tsunami damages has been recorded in the past. And of course, Diablo sits right in the middle of them. So do we know that nuclear power is uneconomic? Let's go to that question. Because I've been touching on ethically, why would you operate these things when they kill people, they go boom, et cetera. They're operating beyond their permits. They cost a bloody fortune. What about the economics? Well. Even if this plant is already built, removing nuclear power will actually save money. I'll give you an example. Rancho Seco nuclear power plant was shut down, as I said earlier. It was closed in 1989. As a utility operating that plant, Sacramento, that SMUD stands for Sacramento Municipal Utility District, lost $575 million. Without nuclear, Within a very short period of time, three years later, they actually made 46 million. Same rates, same utility district. Meaning, it saves you money to close it down. Uh, the World Business Academy, right now, is, uh, is a petition, it's called an intervener, before the Public Utilities Commission of the State of California. In it, we are claiming that we, as ratepayers, have been overcharged $1.4 billion by Edison. That's the amount of money they've charged us since January of 2012, every month. It's approximately $90 million a month. They've charged us that, even though they haven't produced a single electron of energy since January 2012. In fact, the pleading I'm filing tomorrow, the opening line is, help, there's a robbery in progress. I'm actually filing with that headline. Um, because that $1.4 billion has been charged to us and we didn't get any power, which meant we had to pay for what's called replacement power on top of it. So when I come later on in this talk, and I'll tell you about how we're going to make a switch, I just want you to be aware that when you turn off nuclear, you actually create an extraordinary amount of money that you can then apply to renewables. In the case of San Onofre, over $1.4 billion, rising at the rate of $90 million a month. Now, what's fascinating about that number is the newest um, and largest in Germany wind to hydrogen plant cost for 140 megawatts only $237 million. For less than three months of what we're paying for power we're not getting from nuclear, we could have 140 megawatts of absolutely crystal clear clean power. So <clears throat> this is an interesting one. This is Finland. So the initial cost of construction by the largest nuclear company in the world, Arriva, a division of the French government, was $3 billion. Revised cost of construction is of 2012, $8.5 billion. By the way, it's now three years, three and a half years behind schedule. And if it is finished, they've already notified Finland that reactors five and six will be far more ex expensive than ever. So they are going to build a nuclear reactor that is more expensive to build than the CERN Large Hedron Collider, which found the God particle. It's cheaper to find God than it is to make economic sense out of nuclear power. So do we need nuclear power to keep our lights on? Meaning it doesn't make economic sense. We're killing people. Do we need it because without it, these lights wouldn't be on, which is commonly what people believe. So let me show you something interesting. This is a grid. This put together this chart, and this is actually done in the last 12 months, um, by um, California ISO. So California Independent System Operator was created by a law to measure the electrical needs of the state of California and to project how to meet those needs going forward in time. Now, in the yellow part down below is what they calculate to be our peak summer demand. And you notice this goes as far out as 2020. So we're not talking about running out of power tomorrow morning. 
the green band is the excess power. So what it's saying is, if you have all the peak power you need in the peak of the summer for air conditioning, and then you have a reserve, which is quite large, for excess, at the top of the green line is where that is. Nuclear power represents the red line on top of it, meaning you don't even have to have it. And in fact, has anybody noticed that their lights have begun flickering since January 2012 when San Onofre was turned off, which is one of the only two plants we had. We cut our nuclear plants in half, and I don't think anybody noticed any flickering. And in fact, we have more power than we need right now. So it's kind of interesting that we don't need Diablo, because Diablo is the red line on top of the green, and this chart was created after San Onofre was closed. That's what's interesting. This chart reflects after San Onofre. So what do we want to, what do we do about climate change? Now this is the dilemma Jim Hansen got into. Jim Hansen said, but yeah, where are we gonna get our power from? As you just saw, we've got plenty of power already. But it's a legitimate question. Some of that power, going back to that slide, in the yellow and in the green, does come from coal still. Not much in California, but some, and that's soon to be done away with. A lot of it comes from oil, and some of it comes from natural gas, all fossil fuels all dirty fuels at a time when climate change is an issue. So people like Jim Hansen get caught and they say, but you know, yes, we've got this, but we've got it from dirty sources. So he wants to do, what do we do about climate change if we don't do nuclear, how do we get around it? So let's just look at his climate change data for a second. So this is climate change. And I want you to look at this band, just in case people tell you, and you talk to them sometimes at a cocktail party, and, 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 and they say, well, climate change, I don't know, it's just sort of cyclical, it happens. It's been going on for centuries. So to the far left was 400,000 years ago. I hope you can read it up there. To the far right is where we are today. There is a very clear cyclical pattern you can see between the years 400,000 to 350, 300 to 250, 200 to 150. Very clear, very steady, predictable pattern. That comes from the way carbon dioxide accumulation prior to the advent of humans would be a stimulus to more green stuff growing, which would then consume more of the carbon dioxide, bring it back down, and then it would repeat the cycle. But if you notice, we're not even in this cycle. We're far above that cycle. And here we are, as of 1950, we broke out of the pattern right there. And this is, oops, this is the so-called hockey stick right here. This is what people call the hockey stick, meaning the dramatic accelerated increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that natural cycle now has been badly disrupted. This is an interesting one. This is the carbon pollution, and, and this gives you a better sense of the hockey stick. So taking a shorter time, so, and by the way, in case you wonder where some of this data comes from, um, one of the things the Academy monitors closely are what are called ice cores. So we have extraordinarily accurate records of everything that went on on the planet atmospherically going back at least 750,000 years because if you drill deep enough into the Arctic, you get ice and in that ice are small bubbles and in those bubbles of air are trapped all kinds of molecules that you can analyze and then determine what was happening in that period of history. So if you wonder how this stuff gets accumulated, that's where the data comes from. But I want you to notice this acceleration of temperature that's occurred from about 2000 AD. This is virtually a straight line, okay? That's the hockey stick. Now, when you hear about things like Taklaban in the Philippines, which got hit by a storm that's never been recorded that side. This is so much, it was bigger than the Superstorm Sandy. More energy trapped in that one storm than in any storm in recorded history. The reason that happens is because of the heat of the water. So the heat of the water creates the energy that creates the storm. By the way, that same heat in the air causes what's called supersaturation of moisture. So when you have a collision of two air fronts, you get a deluge. So people living on the side of a mountain in Boulder, Colorado never had flood insurance because who would think you'd need it on the side of a mountain? And of course, nobody had it and they needed it. So what's going on right now with carbon pollution, and, 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 and it's funny, we, we did this slide before Taklaban, but the Taklabans are just, these are warm-ups. Sandy is just a warm-up. We're just getting started in this path. And then you see what happened just last week in the Midwest with these extraordinary storms that wiped out entire cities at the end, you know, middle of November. So have we had hurricane, I mean tornadoes before at the end of November in Kokomo, Idaho? Yes, small ones. Sometimes you'll get a residual storm. Nothing like what hit Kokomo this week. 
Okay. So we're, we're dealing in a situation where climate change is the big issue. I want to show you this one real quickly. This one here um, is uh, and the white, if, if you see on the screen, there's a very thick white color. Okay, that white is about, um, it's called old ice. Okay, and, and, and old ice is very important. Old ice means that it survives from winter to winter, as opposed to new ice, which is an accumulation that occurs in a given winter. So by measuring how much old ice there is, it tells you how much absorption of heat is going on, and it also tells you how much reflection from what's called the albedo effect of light back into the atmosphere that's no, that isn't heating the ocean. So when you have less ice, you get sunlight hitting ocean or dirt, heating things up. If there's an iceberg there or if there's a glacier there, 80-some percent will bounce back into space like a giant mirror. So I'm going to show you this because this is kind of a scary little thing. So look at the white ice, the old white ice. Okay, that's the ancient ice pack going away. This counter on the bottom here is just telling you the year. Did you see it? We started in 87. Notice how it's thinning and thinning and thinning. Notice how it's streaming down there. We're still only at 97, 98. Remember, we're, and every year it gets cumulatively worse than the last year. Okay, so you get the sense that we've destroyed the old ancient ice. That's a before and after picture, just in case you didn't see it. There is 1987, and there is 2010. I think that's fairly dramatic. I think you get a sense of what we've done to the Arctic. So the destruction of this Arctic sea ice is obviously an alarming warning sign that if we're at all conscious of not only our grandchildren's future, candidly, our children's future, and I would say if you're under 45, your future is in severe jeopardy. And the, what this is not showing you is how dramatic the effect of that heat is on the release of methane <coughs> from the permafrost. Right now, the permafrost release of methane, we first started writing about this about nine years ago, the Academy, is by far more destructive of the atmosphere and is warming the planet much faster than the CO2 is, even as bad as CO2 is. So that methane, that runaway that's happening is now what's called a negative environmental feedback loop. Meaning, if we went to zero carbon emissions today, so does anybody in this room think we're gonna be at zero CO2 emissions tomorrow morning? Okay, good, so we have rational people in the room. I assume that means that you all know the Earth is round and climate change is real. We've now passed all three tests. <laughs> the chances of us reversing this, even if we went to zero carbon emissions tomorrow, is zero. I repeat, zero. Meaning it cannot be stopped by going to zero CO2. We have an enormous challenge in front of us. The genie is out of the bottle because we have a heating loop called a negative environmental feedback loop that's causing the permafrost to melt, that's off-gassing methane, which now is causing hydrate releases from the ocean, first measured off of Santa Barbara coast, by the way, uh, now known globally. All that's developing, and if we don't put that genie back in the bottle, that will lead to the runaway greenhouse effect that people say might be a problem in 100 years, and in fact, it's a problem right today. And the reason you know it's a problem today is because storms like what hit Taklaban in the Philippines is merely a warm-up. Same with Superstorm Sandy. Or as Governor Cuomo said, this isn't a thousand year storm. This is the new normal or worse. He's right. So I want to show you this one real quickly because I talked about uh, methane. I apologize for the length of this, but Yale takes longer to make a point than most people. This is a Yale piece. When the permafrost thaws, the organic matter in the permafrost thaws as well and begins to decay. The microorganisms start to eat it. If there's no oxygen, the microorganisms make methane. If there's oxygen, the microorgan microorganisms make carbon dioxide. Ah, permafrost. Frozen dirt.
permafrost seems to be decaying and there is the threat that at some point in the not too distant future that a very large amount of the carbon that is stored in the permafrost and frozen soils could be released into carbon cycling. Permafrost, frozen ground that's so cold it stays frozen even during the summer. Permafrost is any earth material under ground surface which at or below zero degrees Celsius for two or more consecutive years. Now in the Arctic, we know that climate is being impacted faster than any of the models have predicted. It's also being impacted to a larger extent than the models have predicted. Some days we can fly through and see methane concentrations and even CO2 concentrations that one might associate with flying near a large oil or natural gas production facility or flying through the middle of a large city. Um, they're elevated that much. But when you look down at the surface, all you see is pristine wilderness, typically wetlands and rivers with sporadic forests and grasslands. This kind of occurrence out in the middle of nowhere, far, far distance from any large human uh, habitation areas is, is quite remarkable to me. There is a high potential for large amounts of carbon to be released from the Arctic ecosystems. How much of this carbon that's currently stored in the frozen permafrost soils, peatlands, and boreal forests is actually susceptible to being mobilized is, is key. Also, how fast this carbon might be released. Is it released over uh, 100 or 150 years, similar to the perturbation pulse that we have from the burning of fossil fuels? Or is it going to be something that happens over a few decades, you know, a few tens of years, in which case the perturbation would be significantly larger? We have at least theoretical control on emissions from human activities, and because of that, we, we still we feel like we can do something to change it if it's, it will be necessary. In case of thawing permafrost, there is no way to control it or to stop it, it just will go by itself. There is a, a reasonable probability that once this starts, the amount of greenhouse gases released could then be larger than, it can even dwarf the amount of greenhouse gases that humans are putting in the air now. And at that point, it's out of completely out of our control in, in the sense that even if the humans stop emitting more greenhouse gases, the release of the trapped carbon material in the tundra uh, just runs away. We don't know exactly what temperature this is going to occur, but as we go to warmer and warmer temperatures, four, five, six degrees centigrade, uh, the many scientists are feeling that this may really kick in. We cannot go there. Dr. Anton Vax of Oxford University has published a new paper which sharpens the focus on when exactly the tipping point for permafrost melt might begin to manifest. The message of your research for us is that somewhere around 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial temperatures globally, uh, yes. that is when we would see continuous permafrost areas begin to melt. Yes. So we probably were uh, managed to put your finger on the threshold when exactly the continuous permafrost start, uh, starts to melt. So uh, this what uh, what it says that uh, it, this is probably the tipping point, the one and a half degree warming. Since the late 1800s, the planet has warmed approximately eight tenths of a degree centigrade, more than halfway to Dr. Bach's critical tipping point, and climbing. I think the most important thing to realize about permafrost is that it's not an, an all or nothing question. It, it's not an issue of if the permafrost thaw, if 30% of the permafrost thaws, then all of the permafrost region will release its carbon. If we can limit our emissions, our CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions, then the permafrost region will release less carbon to the atmosphere. Okay, so what he's saying there, you heard the first part was all about your negative environmental feedback loop. Is there a way, and by the way, and the, the, what the prior scientists were talking about is sometimes referred to as a methane burp. 
<clears throat> meaning at some point, we think it's 1.5 C, which we're about 9.9 C now, um, you get a dramatic increase, an acceleration of heating, and an acceleration of so much more methane that then the acceleration of the heating is compounded. Okay, so that's the that's the the runaway scenario. If you read about it, that's what they're talking about, and that is not what may happen. That is a certainty that is going to happen. Do we know if it's going to happen in 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, 20 years? No, but it's in that range. Now, if you if you want to be optimistic, what the last fellow from from Fairbanks is saying is, if we were to get the CO2 under control now, we can slow that increase in temperature, and we don't have to go to what's called the tipping point or the methane burp. So it's not a minor thing to slow CO2 down. But as you know, this week, the entire planet emitted way more CO2 than it did last week, or frankly, a year ago. So we are continuing to excel in the spewing of carbon dioxide every day. Now, the other part that comes out of that clip that's important is, if we were somehow able to get CO2 back into control, it could lead to a gradual cooling of the planet. And if you cool, that will lock the permafrost back in the bottle. But that's the only way to do it. In other words, you, 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 there's nothing short of a planetary-wide solution. It, it, it's not something I can do or you can do alone. It's something that has to be done on a planetary-wide basis. So right now, humanity is on a track for global warming of the worst case scenario. So you're not on a track for the best case or the medium case, you're on the track for worst case. This is what worst case looks like. Sea level rise of 230 feet. Where'd I get that number? Jim Hansen, finest climate scientist in the world. That's where the new sea level is gonna be. So just picture, if you will, the next time you're out at the beach, I want you to picture a 22, 23 story building sitting on top of the water, and the top of that building is the new sea level. Unfortunately, the temperature at that new sea level will be really not habitable. It'll be kind of like worse than Phoenix in the summertime. We're still trying to calculate how hot it's going to be at the new sea level. But we know the new sea level will be 230 feet higher. And by the way, what that is is a calculation of all of the ice trapped in the Greenland ice sheet together with what's in the Arctic. That's all. It's a simple calculation. Um, there will be massive destruction of freshwater supplies globally. Unsustainably large storms, which just happened in the Philippines, will be a, a sideshow. Floods that you can't believe, that'll make gold boulder like a dim memory, and fires all over the West that will be almost impossible to deal with. Dramatic expansion of desertification, the loss of lives, widespread famine, and last but not least, a complete social breakdown and violent conflict. When people don't have food or water, they kill each other real fast. And what we're looking at is a planet that stands to lose billions of people to these very activities. If you want to know just one statistic alone how bad sea level rise to 230 feet is, more than 75% of the human population today on the planet lives below that sea level. Let's give you some idea. So what can we do? What's the answer? Hydrogen. That's the answer. Hydrogen represents 74% of the known universe. It's the most abundant molecule in existence. In fact, it's so abundant, we look at hydrogen and we don't see it the way a fish doesn't see water. It's just all around us. And so what we're doing is we're saying, step one, if we want to get on top of this whole situation, we have to start creating electricity from renewable sources, 100% renewable, wind, solar, and geothermal, and convert that into hydrogen. This is a simple graph that shows you how to do it. I won't go into too much detail, but if anybody wants the questions, we will. But basically, you take regular water, purify it slightly, you electrolyze it, meaning you split it into hydrogen and oxygen, and you then have hydrogen. If you put these devices I've, I've shown in this diagram at the base of a windmill, the windmill cost of electricity today is going to be 6.7 cents per kilowatt hour if it's unsubsidized. At 6.7 cents per kilowatt hour, I can buy all this equipment, I can produce a kilogram of hydrogen, and I can deliver it up to 200 miles away, including the freight cost, for about $7.50 a kilogram. $7.50 a kilogram is the same amount of power as two gallons of gas. So therefore, without subsidies, I could actually produce hydrogen at prices competitive with gasoline at 350 a gallon. Now I've got a question. If we could place all fossil fuels, all fossil fuels in California, and all nuclear, within 10 years or less, 
at no additional cost to anybody paying for utility bills, except inflation. Show of hands, how many of you would like to do that at this point? Okay, those who don't want to do it, I want to talk to you afterwards, I want to find out why. But if you could replace it, all fossil fuels, all nuclear, 10 years or less, at no additional cost to ratepayers, because this technology exists today, and by the way, I referred earlier to the 140 megawatts built in Germany, that's just how it was built. The company that's leading this revolution, by the way, is Siemens out of Germany. These trucks, by the way, Tirano, just this week, the port of Long Beach and um, uh, Los Angeles uh, have purchased eight of these, are hydrogen semi-trucks, 20-year plan for the port of Houston. They're starting to be made commercial quantities. And this is my favorite thing over here, the H2 Clipper. Uh, Gregory was kind enough to mention in the introduction, I design aircraft, this is the aircraft I designed. And uh, we'll more about that later. Uh, so hydrogen is a transportation fuel, which most people don't realize. Hydrogen is like a battery. It's not a fuel in itself, it stores energy. So you can create energy from windmills, and you don't have to worry about peak times. You can create it from photovoltaic or geothermal. But now you've got it contained by just breaking through electrolyzer, breaking water into hydrogen and oxygen. We have had over 40,000 successful fuelings of private automobiles in Southern California alone. Most people don't know that. That's a soccer mom filling up a van, minivan, a Honda minivan, and frankly, most of the cars in those fill-ups were with unskilled, non-technical soccer moms. That's who they gave them to. Not one incident has ever occurred. And this over here is just an example of how small a stationary fuel cell is that could power everything in your house and then some. And the beautiful thing of hydrogen, of course, it leaves a zero carbon footprint. When you combine, when you combust hydrogen, you get water vapor, and when you use it in a fuel cell, the byproduct is water vapor. This is how it works, I won't go too much, just a simple diagram, tells you how fuel cells work. This is how you can create energy in your house, and in case you're wondering if this is Buck Rogers, almost 6,000 homes in a, in a suburb of Kyoto, Japan, operate exactly like this, and they pay less per month now than they did for the electricity to run their homes before this was installed. So, Here's a question, but isn't hydrogen dangerous? What about the Hindenburg? Gee, I thought it was a really explosive gas. What, this is a really funny thing. It turns out that hydrogen is the safest fuel we have. It's safer than gasoline, diesel, propane, natural gas, anything. Most people don't know that, it's kind of funny. So we took this, this car on the left is a hydrogen car. This is a normal car, okay? It's identical in all the purposes, except this has a hydrogen fuel tank, this has a regular fuel tank. This was a bullet fired at it. The result of the bullet being fired here is you get this 30 foot high blue flame, it's three seconds after the strike. Here you get an explosion. One minute later, this is what's happened to the hydrogen car, that's what's happened to the gasoline car. One minute and 30 seconds later, notice the flame's going out now. Gasoline car, totally destroyed, totally destroyed, totally destroyed. Now, we just had, a, we just had an example of this in Los Angeles last week. Hey, show me, do, does anybody remember hearing the story about the hydrogen truck that caught fire on the freeway? Did you hear about that one? Okay, so we had a, we had a, a, a truck, a fully loaded semi-trailer full of hydrogen. It was going down the freeway here in Los Angeles last week. All the news channels carried it. The cab caught fire. It melted the valves that was holding the hydrogen in the cylinders behind the cab. So the hydrogen started shooting out. And what happened was the driver walked away. The cab was incinerated because basically he was, the cab was in front of that flame and nothing went boom. Now if that had been propane, diesel, or gasoline, you would have cleared or leveled three to four city blocks. By the way, the same thing happened by accident in Emeryville, California about six or seven months ago. A guy accidentally lit a match near a hydrogen refueling station for the buses for the East Bay Utility. I don't know what he was thinking, lit the match, went up in flames. Not only did the idiot that light the ma lit the match, he walked away safely, no damage, no destruction in any of the buildings. They replaced the chimney and it was reopened within a matter of a couple months. It's fueling buses today. That's impossible with any other fuel. That's a picture of the truck I told you about. This was taken in Los Angeles just last week. Notice, cab caught fire, hydrogen tanks never went boom. That could not happen in any other kind of fuel. And if you, anybody wants to the question, why do people think the Hindenburg caught, 
I'll be happy to answer that. So, H2 Clipper Inc. We, I invented the H2 Clipper because I wanted to come up with a way to end run the enormous amount of the many tens of trillions of dollars invested in distributing fossil fuels between our coal mines and our ships at sea and our, our fuel lines and our pipelines. We've built in trillions of dollars of expense to take these fossil fuels and put them to market. And you can't ever replicate that kind of expense today. So how are you gonna get huge amounts of hydrogen all over the world relatively quickly without replicating that? And to do that, we started thinking through this problem at the academy, and we decided that the real solution was to, to use the lifting power of hydrogen, that it's lighter than air, and to create a hydrogen-powered dirigible, which uses no fossil fuels, which could transport enormous amounts of gas, people, or freight. For example, the craft you're about to see can move a pound of freight from China to California for about the cost of moving the same pound by sea, except it can do it in 12 hours flat. A uh, vehicle you're about to see in a second can have delivered um, Tacloban. They could not get um, water for five days or food. This vehicle would have been on the ground 12 hours after the disaster. So we decided to start looking into how could we create such a thing, and we started designing some specifications, and this is what we came up with. Before I push the, so you can see this very short video, um, and I might talk a little as it's going through just so you know what you're looking at. This aircraft you're about to see is now heavily patented by the United States government, has been thoroughly investigated for two years at the highest levels of the U.S. Pentagon. Uh, and everything, every claim you're going to hear me talk about has been investigated separately by at least a half a dozen different admirals with anywhere from two to three stars on their lapels. Flies at speeds in excess of 350 miles an hour, can lift 650,000 pounds into the air, can be made completely like Henry Ford made cars in a completely modular fashion, will turn out to be the cheapest aircraft ever invented, and we believe the most revolutionary aircraft since Kitty Hawk. So this is, if I can get it to work, the H2 Clipper. Oops, don't know where it went. Huh, there it is. I don't know why it's not going. Here we go. This one's 1,000 feet long. That's actually Hangar 1 at NASA Ames Field. Now notice as it's getting released, the engines aren't even on. It's just lifting. Hydrogen is carrying it into the air. It's a free elevator into space. What you're looking at there, those windows for perspective, are about three to four times the size of a normal window in an airplane. This is showing you how the skin is made of Kevlar impregnated with Teflon. This is showing the engines which are made, which actually combust gaseous hydrogen at low pressure. This is showing you the construction. The first vehicle in the history of the world constructed what's called an exoskeleton, meaning 100% of the bearing weight is carried in the external diameter of the, of the ship. It's a completely modular construction. Every single beam, every single hub is identical in all capacities. So you can assemble them like an erector set. This is showing the floor of where the hydrogen is stored that goes up to the, the ballons to inflate, and it's where it's pumped back down. When we want to come back to ground, we just recompress it. These sleds actually carry approximately 650 kilograms of hard, actually 650 kilograms now. Uh, they're soon being redesigned by Lincoln Composites to develop at 1,000 kilograms. That's the floor. Shows you how much empty space you got for cargo. This is what's below that floor. This particular one is configured for 500 passengers. These are first class fully reclining seats on the left and the right. That's the first class restaurant. 24 state rooms with queen size beds, lamps, and a sitting chair. That's coach with coach lounge, coach restaurant, and coach bar. Uh, this is just showing the control surfaces. This particular one was done for the Navy, so we had to show all the control surfaces, etc. And what this one's showing is that each of the compartments is a different size depending on where in the ship it is because the thicker the ship, the closer together the bulkheads are. The black line has no bearing strength. It's just showing where the separation of the ballons are. This next shot just shows you that the engines can rotate in a completely circular fashion. So if you want, you can use them for maneuverability as well as acceleration. 
they even go sideways. And um, that's pretty much the substance of it. So that's the H2 Clipper. We can build them any size from 300 feet to 1,000 feet long. This is a 1,000 foot long one. As you can tell, it's kind of like a spaceship going sideways. It's extremely aerodynamic. It consumes zero energy when it goes to space, and when it comes back down, almost zero. So it just goes up on its hydrogen lifting capacity and comes back down. So where I'm gonna end tonight, because we're about time for questions, uh, we're doing something that I wanted you to know about. We are in front, we are what's called an intervener, as I said earlier, with the California Public Utilities Commission. So our job is to try and represent the people of the state of California on complex utility matters, which is what we're doing in San Onofre. They've invited us to participate in a thing called the Long-Term Power Procurement Hearings, set for late 2014. And we're gonna surprise them because we're gonna issue a Kennedy S challenge like I started with tonight. And that challenge is simply this. It's, if I say to you, which I'm going to say to the state of California, we will show you how to replace all fossil fuels, all nuclear, do it within 10 years or less at no additional cost to the ratepayers, other than inflation, no additional cost, we can convert. And it's a lot easier than the challenge Kennedy issued, which was land a man on the moon in 10 years. He didn't know how we would do that. We actually know how we can convert California. And if we convert California, given that Germany's secretly doing the same thing, the entire world will follow us. Once we do that, we'll radically reduce CO2 emissions. And with the abundant power that we release, we'll not only increase the economic well-being of the country dramatically, but we'll create enough cheap energy that we can then do what's called carbon capture. Because see all that CO2 up there? We gotta get it back. We dumped it in the middle of the county ground, fairgrounds, and we gotta go clean it up. And if we do recapture it, and I'm happy to report, we were looking actually quite carefully at what would we do if we recaptured a bunch of CO2, and we came up with one idea we liked, which was to recarbonize it and turn it into basically insulation material. And then just two weeks ago, the Green Chemistry Society came up with a technique for catalyzing it in with catalytic conversion technology and turning it into plastic, which is fine with me too, because the goal is get it out of the air and turn it into something useful that's not going to re-emit CO2 later. So our goal is to do that. And we believe that the process for creating the demand side of the equation is there, meaning we have incentives and all sorts of things I won't go into unless you want me to, but it's a very complete composite plan to absolutely convert California in 10 years or less. So you decide, would you rather have Diablo Canyon in your future or the H2 Clipper? It actually is your decision. Thank you. Hello. All right, cool. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I want to go back to the Sacramento uh, Municipal Utility District sure. and how they lost so much money uh, when the power plant was in service and they, they uh, made money afterwards. What did they replace the power with and what costs, uh, I guess, what cost the district so much? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> first of all, one of the reasons that that's an interesting story is because the man who was running SMUD at that time, a guy named <coughs> David Freeman, um, figured out that he was losing more money on nuclear than he could be saving if he would find renewable energy systems that would work just as well. So he led the conversion, he led the shutdown effort, and then he became a very famous environmental lawyer, and he's actually one of our partners in front of the California Public Utilities Commission now. So the mix is always different depending on where you are. SMUD went for a mix of some additional hydroelectric, uh, they actually did get involved with photovoltaic fairly early, which was amazing because it was pretty expensive back then. Uh, and they spread into a number of different alternative technologies. They also provided some money for people to do what is called negawatts, sometimes written about by Amory Lovins. A negawatt is a watt of energy that you don't use. So as an example, most of you are young enough today to, st uh, to remember, old enough today to remember incandescent light bulbs, okay? Well, they burn an enormous amount of electricity. And then we came up with basically what looked like little neon bulbs, right? And those were a lot more energy efficient, like four times as efficient. Well, now we have LEDs, which are 18 to 20 times more efficient than the incandescent light bulb. So if you just replace the two light bulbs, you dramatically lower the amount of energy you use. 
and that's typical across a wide variety of choices. So in any particular city, it's, it's, it's different. I'll, I'll give you another example, though, which SMUD discovered, and is true now that we have San Onofre offline. When you move electricity from point A to point B over a long distance transmission line, you're gonna lose 26 to 40% of all the electrons. That's a big, how many people run a business where 26 to 40% of the fish are gone before you serve it on the plate? I mean, that's a lot of line loss. And that happens because you're going from a large base station power plant, or base plant they call them, to the end user. Well, if you create the power closer to where the user is, you actually don't have that problem. And one of the key concepts we're introducing in the state of California is we want to let people elect to go green literally neighborhood by neighborhood and we'll replace, we won't take their substation down, we'll just put a fuel cell there. So they won't have to lose their umbilical cord to the web if they're afraid that they're going to lose their connection to the net. But, the, but in point of fact, they'll be getting all their electricity from that point forward from a fuel cell at the base of the power station, at the uh, substation. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm very concerned with the Diablo Canyon power plant. I've actually biked around that area and it's beautiful. Avila Beach is just beautiful. And what can we do as undergrads to um, help shut down this plant? Well, um, first of all, take one of my cards later on before you leave and um, get a hold of, uh, when you write a, a, a message to me or to info at worldbusiness.org, tell them that's what you want to do. We'll put you together with, there's uh, two very active local groups, um, Mothers for Nuclear, uh, nuclear Against nuclear, nuclear Energy up in the Diablo Canyon area. Uh, there are a couple of other environmental groups that are, like us, involved in trying to stop Diablo Canyon. So um, don't know what your skill set is, uh, you could be a community organizer, you could be um, a, a someone le learning economics, you could be someone training in pre-law. There's always something for you to do. In fact, I always say to people, <laughs> I, I forgot to say it tonight, you know, these challenges are so massive. I mean, you, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. I figure out we're going to figure out how to get out of this, but I don't know how just yet. But I do know this for a fact. Anybody who thinks that they can't do anything because they can't do everything is wrong. So if you can do anything, do it. You know, if you can just lower your own electrical consumption today, do it. And what you'll find is that little bit that you can do cumulatively changes how people think about the big questions. So if you can do big things, great. But if you can't, do little things. And Mother Teresa had this great line I always loved. Uh, there is no such thing as a small act of love. Just there isn't, right? So whatever you can do, do it. Don't let what you think are your limitations stop you because whatever your little bit is, when you add it to everybody else, it's, the ocean is nothing but a bunch of drops that got together. Um, I would also like to thank you for coming today to speak to us. Um, I'm curious about the risks that would be associated with switching to hydrogen as a power source um, with the amount of uh, water vapor that would be released if all of the different sources would be switched to that? Yeah, um, probably not an issue, let me explain. The way that the water vapor is released is because it's releasing something that you took apart in the first place. So e e using hydrogen doesn't create or consume water, it just changes it from left to right. So uh, the total amount of water won't go up and hydrogen will have nothing to do with it. The worst problem is that as we heat the planet, we are creating saturation of moisture, meaning the, the air is holding more water. And that water vapor is what's causing all these floods that you read about and hear about. Uh, I did a presentation uh, for uh, Deepak Chopra recently uh, down at his center and um, they told me I was gonna be talking in August. So I looked at the most recent month on record, June, and I collected a series of slides of how many floods there were in June. You'll be astounded how many enormous floods there were, like 12 world-class floods in June all over the planet. And nobody had stopped and looked at all of them as like symptom of the same phenomenon. All those came from the same reason, supersaturated water. And they stretched everywhere from ricochet, I mean the Ganges had that giant wall of water, 200, 300 foot fall wall of water. Uh, Calgary, Canada was underwater. Oneida, New York was underwater. Prague was underwater, Elba River overflowed. I mean, it was a series of floods, all in one month, June of last year, or this year, actually, in June of this year. Over there.
Thanks again for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering, in your 10-year plan to make this conversion, uh, it says it's about the same price, but what's the price of inflation in that change? Well, I, I said not, not including inflation. And the reason I said that a couple times is because uh, inflation is the one thing I can't control. But inflation will affect fossil fuel rates probably greater than it will affect hydrogen. See, uh, fossil fuel is based on the assumption of scarcity. In other words, there's only so much of it, so you've got to pay more for it as you dig deeper to get it, whether it's a deeper oil well or a deeper coal mine. So uh, a scarcity con economy, which is what fossil fuels are based on, uh, inherently is more subject to distortion when inflation occurs than what I would call an abundance economy. So when you're dealing with 74% of the known universe, i.e. hydrogen, you're never going to run out of it. That's, you don't have to deal with that issue. So inflation will impact you because of distribution costs, but it won't, it won't impact you anywhere near as much uh, as it would fossil fuels. I also want to point out for you who haven't thought of this interesting little thing that's happened to us as human beings, is we've gone from more carbon intense fuels, wood, to coal, to gases and oils. And as we've done that, as we've gotten least carbon intensive, the economy has grown greater. So all we gotta do is complete the transition to zero carbon fuels. So it's, we're doing it. We just gotta get there faster before we touch the planet in the meantime. Eddie, another, I know this gentleman, this fellow here. Hi, um, I'm really happy to hear your solution is hydrogen, but uh, my question to you is how do we get China and India on board as they're bringing more and more coal power plants online every day? Well, actually, that's a, that's a great com uh, comment. First of all, uh, I don't know if any of you, uh, show of hands, did any of you read the, um, the report of the Politburo from China that came out about nine days ago? Any of you, you read it, okay. So for those of you who didn't, um, the, the Politburo issues in a report once every 10 years, uh, roughly equivalent to when they reelect a new premier, and they set forward what their 10-year plan is. So you know what the new team's gonna do for the next 10 years, because they're in power. It's a one-party system, there is no <laughs> There's no Republican Congress to deal with. It's just they, they have their way and they do it. Um, and they basically, uh, they, the, the two key issues they, they keyed off of were uh, creating a consumer economy and the other was environmental re remediation because they see that they, they don't have livable cities anymore. So uh, China actually slowed down its coal consumption. And um, what we need to do in the West, and this is what Siemens is doing in Germany, what we'd like to see California doing here in California, is we'd like us to be the leaders in a technology that would, the Chinese would adapt because it would be so much more economically viable, there'd be no reason to do it. And just to make sure you know that they would do that, remember, we invented windmills in Germany and the US. The Chinese make them all now, and the Indians. Uh, we invented photovoltaic in Germany and the US. It's all made in China now. So uh, it's clear that the Chinese are real quick to pick up on a technology that works and, and deploy it. They would be delighted to use hydrogen. I mean, it solves a lot of their problems. Thank you for your um, presentation. It, so it seems inevitable that our society will change, we will have you know, drastic climate changes because of the um, consequences of things that have been done in the past and the carbon emissions. Um, so even if, you know, our world adopts the hydrogen technology and other alternative forms of energy, um, as you mentioned, we're going to have different changes. Are there um, certain think tanks or like preparatory um, mechanisms in place right now to help us prepare for like the sea level increasing, the social viol like violence that you mentioned that might increase in yeah, the future? It's a great question. Uh, the only the business academy that I'm aware of. We're the only one so far. Um, the, um, the, the real thing, though, to focus there upon is, um, particularly given how young you are, uh, you don't want to go through a dystopian future. You, you don't want to go through what it looks like um, if you're living in the equivalent of the Philippines or almost any place else on the planet where people are going to be incre increasingly forced to struggle to survive or leave. You know, people often forget that there are 300,000 environmental refugees just from the city of New Orleans from Katrina that have never gone back and never will. Um, I just was, I had the good fortune to have dinner a couple weeks ago with Mohammed Yunus from Bangladesh and, 
And uh, Eunice was talking about how basically 10% of that country is now gone. It's the fifth most populous nation in the world. It's, there's people everywhere. When you lose 10% of the country, where do, they, where do they go when they got 160 million people? And that country is in imminent jeopardy of losing another 10, 15% of its land area within less than a decade. So where do those people go? What do they do? And um, if, uh, right now, the, the, the Yangtze River is in jeopardy. The Yellow River is in jeopardy in China. Um, uh, the Ganges will be dry within 25 years. <laughs> what are those people going to do? I mean, so you're talking about the, when you're talking about the Asian continent, you're talking about, uh, uh, right now, if you go to the, uh, the glaciers that are, feed all those five major rivers of Asia, all are at the, what's called the Himalayan High Plateau. So they're 12,000 feet and above. And I, I didn't have it tonight, but I can show you a satellite picture of how fast those glaciers are shrinking. And what happens is those glaciers shrink. They, they get further and further from where the headwaters of the river is. And that's very porous rock up there. So when you get too far away, too little of it is getting down into the river. So you've got decreasing melt, in, and you've got smaller glaciers, going on even as you have increasing population. So we've got a real double whammy going. And that's why I think it's critical that we immediately turn to uh, renewable energy and that we use the excess savings to recapture the CO2. And, and there's some other things. If you haven't heard this word, you will. Sometimes people are negative about it, but I'm very positive. It's called geoengineering. Geoengineering is the science of engineering large system solutions to make the planet habitable again. So we've studied in the academy well over 100 proposed geo geoengineering solutions. Virtually, I don't know of a single one we haven't studied that's been announced. Only two of them we can find work so far, but two do work. One of them has to do with what's called cloud whitening, which has been invented by some British professors that's <laughs> gone through beta tests, where you can literally create massive clouds in the middle of the ocean out of seawater using basically photovoltaic energy on large catamaran ships and that are robot ships. And you blast the sea, these, these sea particles up about 5,000 feet in the air, forms a, a white, like umbrella, and that reflects light back off that part of the ocean, thereby reducing the temperature underneath it. So we, by doing that and by sucking carbon out of the air, for example, as recently as two years ago, the accepted scientific conclusion was it would cost $600 per ton to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. Fairly expensive, but hey, if it's that or die, I'll pay it. Well, there's one professor now who's, who's announced a major theory he's got that looks like the paper looks very good. He thinks he can extract CO2 for $50 a ton. So a dramatic decrease in the cost of the extraction of CO2. And the nice thing about extracting CO2, air anywhere is equal to air everywhere. And by the way, just to give you a marker on CO2, you should be watching for this. <clears throat> uh, Bill McKibben, 350.org, if you know about Bill, <clears throat> thought, and that's why the name is, above 350 parts per million you're probably in a non-sustainable path. So, and the way they measure parts per million of CO2 is on top of one mountain in Hawaii called uh, the Mauna Loa Mountain. And what they do is they measure it every day. They just take a sniff of the air going by and they go, how many parts per million do we get in the CO2? And Bill thought 350 was the maximum. The international scientific community thought 400 was survivable. And we just clocked past 406. Okay, so we're well on our way past anything that's within reason. So you gotta, gotta go suck that stuff out. And then when you suck it out, you do not wanna stick it back in the ground as a gas because it kills people. You wanna either carbonize it or you wanna turn it back into plastic. Other questions? Oh, yes, sir, right here. I like these questions, thank you. You know, you agree to do a talk at eight o'clock, you're wondering if anybody will be awake at the end of it, so I appreciate it, thank you. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. Um, Re referring to that sucking um, of the carbon, I'm curious, let, let's say the, your, your plan of um, transitioning to hydrogen works in, in the 10 years that you project, we, we miraculously pull it off. What are we gonna do with the excess 50 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Suck it out of the air. And what are some of the technologies, and I'm curious as to some more low tech ones, less technologically advanced ones, like, like just plants, for example. No, okay, let's take plants. First of all, plants, <clears throat> Plants are a great short-term solution. And in fact, when CO2 goes up, what happens is plants grow faster. They re-suck more CO2 because of photosynthesis. And what will probably happen when you see the Philippines a year from today is where all those people, because you had 14 million people affected, right? So a lot of places where those people were living, there won't be people living there next year. But there will be plants growing. So the plants will have replaced the people. 
and those plants will be sucking up CO2, whereas the people were making CO2. Now, those people are making CO2 somewhere else, but in that one locale, the plants will be coming back to life. Uh, we've slowed down rainforest destruction. Haven't stopped it, but slowed it down dramatically. So every time you keep rainforest going, more CO2 gets sucked up. However, this is the, this is the conundrum. Plants die. So unless you have very, very trees that are capable of very long lives, thousand years, like coast redwoods, sequoias, that sort of thing, <clears throat> you're gonna trap the CO2 for a while, but when the plant dies, or the tree, it's gonna emit all that CO2 back de as decaying matter. So plants give you a temporary respite. And by the way, the, the, the fast, the slow growing 1,000 year sequoias also are slow growing, therefore they don't suck up as much CO2 as a rapidly growing one. So you can get some short term advantage out of planting more trees, which is a good thing. But for the long term solution, you gotta literally get the CO2 and put it back into the form it was when we found it, which was solid. So a solid form would be taking and recarbonizing it and making it into building insulation. Uh, or turning it into plastic because plastic's not going to revaporize. I was delighted the Green Chemistry Association came up with that just this last week. And this gentleman did. Thank you for being patient. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's two other variables besides carbon dioxide that uh, uh, you should consider. And one is the tilt of the Earth has changed. And there's a scientific paper in Nature. Uh, several years ago, and uh, it's been accepted. And so the tilt of the Earth has changed within the last number of years. And the second variable is uh, that there's sunspots. The, the the variability of sunspots has a remarkable effect on on the climate. And so CO2 isn't the only thing to beat yeah. upon. Yeah. And these is the other two variables that we can't control, seemingly. Actually, I wasn't laying on CO2. I was laying on CO2, methane, um, upwellings from the ocean, and the albedo effect. There's four causes. Um, however, I, I'm glad you brought up the tilt of the Earth. That's a good one. So the tilt of the Earth has occurred. It's a very slight change, as you know. For those of you who aren't aware, um, very recently, December 21 of 2012, the Earth passed through what's called the mid-plane of the galaxy, meaning here was the Milky Way galaxy, and here's the planet Earth for a million and a quarter years, a million and a half years, and it got just past the midpoint. So the effect of the gravitational pull of the galaxy slightly, ever so slightly, affected the tilt of the Earth. It's less than two degrees, as I recall, in that paper, right? So it's not a big number, but it did slightly. So people say, well, gee, could that have something to do with it? Mm, probably not, because that took 1.4 million years to happen. And the data, if you recall, that I showed you on that slide. Well, this paper in science shows that there is an effect. No, there is an effect, but here's, here's what I'm getting at. I showed you this one already. This is the effect you're talking about. Right there. See, this is the effect. That's 400,000 years ago. Okay? This is the effect you get. This is also sunspots, by the way. This chart accumulates both. And that's what you get. It looks like a heart beating. You get a regular cyclicality. What happened is a disruption that disruption in the cyclicality, that doesn't look like that line, or that line, or that line, or this line. That's what is in question. Well, it's not a question that that line exists. And so my point is, these are all of the things that I don't mind seeing. This is fine. This is what I called earlier, I went too fast, but I called the natural rhythms. So sunspots are in those natural rhythms over a 400,000 year period. The tilt of the Earth is calculated in there as well, but this, this is humankind. That was man-made. And see, that's 50,000 years ago. So this is, the, this is really where it started with the Industrial Revolution. But thank you for bringing it up, because I'm glad you did, because that is something that gets talked about a lot. That's why, that's, that's why I made that graph. Yes, sir. This gentleman in the front. I want to thank you for an outstanding presentation. I've been in academic life for 38 years, so I can easily say that this talk was among the 10 best that oh, I've heard. There are other factors that play a significant role. In the last 100 years, all the wars were energy related. The amount of money, for example, just we spent in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. So that factor plays a big role in here. Um, 
Now, the question is, is there any disadvantage, drawback, that we should know about this system? Yeah, and, and just because I want to touch on the first, the first part of that comment. So remember I said that I'd been doing a lot of work with the Pentagon at the highest levels? One of the reasons I was called in to that conversation was because the Pentagon has concluded that it cannot hold the Middle East. It's not, it's not anywhere doubting that. It's, Pentagon's getting ready to, it knows that's over. In fact, it thinks that not only the Middle East oil, but it now believes the Middle East period. And so the US military for the first time is beginning, because for most people don't realize, if you look at your geopolitical boundaries, the reason we are in the Middle East is because of oil. And I mean, I'm sure everybody understands we're not there because we like camels. <clears throat> so when you take away the demand for oil, which we're doing in this country, all of a sudden you don't need to have an armed presence all over the Middle East. And that is the first part of the equation. You're absolutely right. And the cost of that, that armed presence to what they, you know what they call it the Pentagon? Their euphemism for it is holding the pipeline. <laughs> it's like to maintain control of the pipeline, they got to spend all this money. Okay, the second part of your comment, though, which is very interesting, do we know of any unintended consequences? I think that's a really good question. How we got to hydrogen, the Academy started an energy task force a little over 15 years ago. And at, when we started, we were looking at the fact that it looked to us like oil was not going to last forever. And we didn't know what the end date would be. And what caused us to investigate it was we caught the Saudis lying about their reserves. In fact, in my book, and I don't know, you know, if you could, tomorrow, if you could send the chart on the Saudi reserves, I'll find it for you. Um, what we just get, there's a chart in my book, and what it shows is miraculously, every year since 1986, I believe, the Saudis have in, found new oil supplies exactly equal to what they pumped every year. Now, the actual oil supplies in Saudi Arabia is a state secret punishable by treason and death, if you talk about it. It's a very closely guarded secret. But if you look at what they pumped, and then you look at what they claim are the reserves, it turns out that it's exactly equal, which is impossible. So we published that as a graph in the book. But I started with that graph 15 years ago, and I said, wow, if this is going on, maybe we don't have unlimited oil. And if we don't have unlimited oil, what do we do for energy? And what if we couldn't hold the Middle East because militarily we can't hold it? So that led to a meeting of about 350 senior executives here in Santa Barbara that we held. And at that meeting, over a four-hour period, it became abundantly clear. Nobody in the room knew what we were talking about or what we were concerned about. And so we said, wow, it looks like we got to go learn about renewable energies really quick because nobody seems to be onto this question. And so we started studying renewable energies. And we hadn't even thought of hydrogen at that point. It wasn't even a glimmer of an idea. So we started putting together with our task force an in-depth investigation, every conceivable form of energy you can imagine. Things that are dreamed about and never been done, all the way to, to multiple designs of nuclear reactors to something as simple as what's called pump and store. I mean, every conceivable form of energy. And as we looked at all of those, uh, it became abundantly clear that the only thing that could replace fossil fuel would be hydrogen, in our, in our opinion. So we started looking at that, and as we looked at it more, we started looking for unintended consequences. And that's when we got shocked, and we, uh, I said earlier, I didn't give you the answer, the Hindenburg. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the reason the Hindenburg went up in flames was, uh, and there's an official report put out by a man named Dr. Addison Bain of NASA, which has been republished by the Pentagon now, uh, and what he basically concluded correctly was the Hindenburg was coated with basically a, a powdered form of an aluminum acetate, which is what you make solid rocket boosters out of. And the report concluded with the sentence, the message of the Hindenburg is don't coat your balloon with rocket fuel. <laughs> so rocket fuel is what brought the Hindenburg down uh, and not uh, the, the explosion of any hydrogen. In fact, I urge anybody who hasn't seen the Hindenburg recently, the, 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 it's on the Google, you can go see it. Take a look at it, and you'll notice that even though it's on fire from stem to stern, the fire was started by a, a small bomb that went off in the tail, which people believe was an act of sabotage. So the fire spreads rapidly across the envelope of the dirigible because it was rocket fuel. And then you see the dirigible opens up. Literally, it's like a cantaloupe that's broken open. And the 
hydrogen is starting to escape, and as it does, the Hindenburg gently settles to the ground, gently. So 37 people jumped off the Hindenburg because they thought they were gonna die. All 37 died. The ones who rode it to the ground, including a couple that were 82 years old who sat on their bunk bed and decided they were gonna die, so they might as well just be comfortable, <laughs> rode it to the ground and walked off unharmed. The only other person who died in the Hindenburg crash, besides people who jumped off out of fear, was one poor sucker who was underneath where it came down. That's it. Now, the reason that's such a powerful story is that the, the lifting power of hydrogen is so enormous that even if it was completely ruptured, it was still providing lift. Now, very quick, I'll end on this because it's a funny story. Why does everybody think hydrogen is so deadly and dangerous, is the question. And where did that Hindenburg story come from? Well, the actual story happens is that just before it crashed, as you recall, the Hindenburg, which had giant 40-foot high swastikas painted on its tail, intentionally took a detour over New York City before it went to Lyndhurst, New Jersey. And it did it at 1,000 feet high, so 1,000 feet off the ground, and it was a 1,000-foot long ship. It looked like a floating man-made island. And the point of the swastikas on the tail, and, the, and this was in 1936, the point of this was to convince the Americans it would be fruitless to support the British because the Germans were a master race with invincible technology. So they flew it over Manhattan, landed in Lincoln, and the thing goes up in smoke. Roosevelt, always aware to a good PR campaign when he saw one, said, you see, hydrogen is unsafe, you can't do anything. And he put out this whole campaign, which was completely fallacious, about how dangerous hydrogen was. And it was so effective, Hitler grounded his remaining Zeppelins and disabled them. And what Roosevelt said at the same time, he put out through all of his, the papers and through the military was, the only safe gas is helium because it's inert and it won't burn. He didn't mention at the time that 100% of the entire helium supply of the world was in the United States. Meaning that if you want air machines, we can know people can make them. That Hitler bought it is amazing, and the rest is history. And of course, since then, we haven't gone back to them. People often ask me, uh, how safe would that dirigible UC be? And the answer is it would be safer than anything that ever flew in the air. But uh, thanks for the question, and we have looked, and we can't find them, unintended consequences. If you think of some, please let me know. Uh, we have to end now, it's 9.30. Uh, thank you so much for coming out, and let's all th uh, thank uh, Mr. Rubico for an excellent you. talk. <laughs>